Ladies and gentlemen, hello. My name is Jay, I'm from Another Dying, and this is Caves of Cud. So I have, like, a year or two ago, I've already played this game on this channel. I've started kind of an ill-conceived and very short video series of me playing this game. And, um, yeah, that didn't really go anywhere. And, um, yeah, I've kind of, I've kind of got the itch to play this again. And to, uh... I've played a bunch of this before, but I kind of wanted to record myself playing this again. So I've decided to basically just reboot the whole thing, start from scratch. So this is going to be episode one of me playing Caves of Kurt. And uh, just, um, yeah, get back into it and uh, see what's happened in the world of Kurt, I guess. So this game is still in early access as um, uh, it's basically in perpetual development. There's a bunch of new stuff in here. And uh, yeah, like many roguelikes, there's stuff being added and so on all the time. So uh, yeah, that's probably going to be interesting. So just to get big into it, we're going to basically create a new character and do some stuff. Since I'm going to treat this like the very first video of this series, I'm going to like in the beginning for the first run, I'm going to explain a lot of things and just talk about a lot of things and maybe read a bunch of stuff about the law and so on. Um, in subsequent runs, it's going to be much shorter, much much snappier because um, yeah, the beginning of the game you have to do all the time and at some point you get just a routine and just go through that stuff like lightning fast. But uh, I'm not going to start that way because... Um, yeah, that's just going to be really confusing. So, uh, yeah, just as a as a heads up. So there's a bunch of cool stuff now here, which wasn't there before. So we can create a new character. We can roll a completely random character, which can mean something entirely not viable for play, but could be interesting. Um, we can save character builds into a library of character builds, which is also cool, which is something that we're probably going to do once we find something good. And we can play a weekly challenge. So the the developers of Caves of Cud, Freehold, they kind of got on the challenge train, which is something that a lot of roguelikes do, like the like the daily challenge in Spelunky or something like that. And it's always kind of awesome because you have some sort of like comparability in a game where a lot is determined by a random number generation. And um, this works kind of differently in a way. So you have a fixed character build at World Seed, but um, it's only weekly. That makes sense because there isn't a lot of... Uh, yeah, if you have a good game of Caves of Cud, um, that can actually take a while. That is probably not done in a day. So um, yeah, it makes sense to have it only weekly. And also, there's, it's not like about just having one shot at this and... Uh, about leaderboard stuff and all this kind of stuff. It's not really a competitive thing here. I think what this actually does is it gives you a an interesting character build and says, hey, try it with this one. And a, a lot of this game is about like trying out different character builds and see where you can develop your character and so on. And um, this is kind of a nice idea to basically get you out of your comfort zone, I guess. Um, we're not going to start with that. I'm going to start by actually creating a new character and kind of walk you through the character building process. But uh, what I'm going to do for this series is I'm going to change it up a little. So uh, we're going to create a bunch of characters and try a bunch of different stuff. Um, maybe I'm going to basically do some random runs, just um, maybe roll a random character or something. And uh, we're going to do the weekly challenges. So I'm going to put that in the title of the video once I do it. And uh, so, yeah, that could be interesting. And uh, yeah, so, but let's just start by creating a new character. So the first option you get here is to play a mutated human or true kin. True kin are basically just your normal everyday, not everyday, but your normal humans. And um, you don't have any mutations. Mutations is kind of what makes the mutated humans interesting. They are like special skills and special characteristics that the true kin don't have. But to make up for that, they they get more skill points each level and they have higher attributes. So um, yeah, both of them 
can be interesting. Uh, I mostly play mutated humans because the mutations are ridiculous fun in this game, but there is like something to be said for playing true kin. Um, yeah, we're going to do again, we're going to change this up a lot and play a lot of different kinds of character types. So we're probably also going to play true kins. For now, the first character I'm going to create is going to be a mutated human and I'm going to play a character that will be kind of yeah that won't be that will be kind of good in the beginning I guess so that we get a good start and not just die immediately as so I'm going to play it a little safe for the first one but uh, yeah I'm going to step out of that comfort zone I hope so let's just start a new character we're going to play a mutated human as I said and what we now have to do is we have to put a bunch of points into stats. And that is already really important because that already kind of determines what kind of character you're going to play. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to play a mainly agility based character. So uh, we're going to be a melee character and agility based. What we want to do is we want to be extremely fast, have extremely high dodge value so that we get hit as few times as possible. And for that we need all the agility that we can get, so let's get that up to 24. If we would, were playing a true kin, we would have higher attributes here, and uh, we could get that even higher, but, well, not gonna do that. So, we're gonna get agility as high as possible. Agility determines your accuracy with both melee and ranged weapons and your ability to dodge attacks. Strength score determines how effectively you penetrate your opponent's armor with melee attacks and how much damage your melee attacks do. We want to get high damage, but we're not going to do that with strength. We're going to do something else. So we're not going to get a lot of strength. Let's just put like two points into that, and maybe even less. Let's put two points into that, um, because it also affects our carry capacity, and to have very little carry capacity can be kind of annoying. And there's toughness, determines your number of hit points, so we're going to put some points into that. Your hit point regeneration rate and your ability to resist poison and disease. So to not be too frail, we're going to put just a little bit into that. Um, I think this could actually be our Achilles heel, that we have not a lot of toughness. Because, um, yeah, let's see. So we're probably going to be relatively frail, but uh, yeah. I hope to make up with that with our high agility. Intelligence determines your number of skill points and your ability to examine artifacts. So, um, could be interesting, but it determines your number of skill points. That is really important for us, because we need a lot of skill points. Because there's a lot of um, skills we definitely need to get. And um, so we're going to put intelligence also way up there to at least 20, I would say. Willpower determines the frequency with which you may use your mental mutations, your hit point regeneration rate and your ability to resist mental attacks. So if we were playing some sort of with mental mutations and all this kind of stuff, willpower could be interesting. It is not for us, so we're not going to put any points into willpower. And your ego score determines the potency of your mental mutations. Again, we don't need that because we won't have mental mutations. Our ability to haggle with merchants, that's kind of good. Um, and your ability to dominate the wills of other living creatures. So we're just going to put two points into ego, I guess. And we have like, we could, what we now could do is increase our toughness some more, or just put two more points into intelligence. You know what? I'm going to go with intelligence. Let's see. Like the, the toughness is going to be tough ha, for us. But uh, yeah, let's just try this for now. Okay, now we're done here. We have basically distributed every point, every uh, every attribute point. So let's go on. Can you actually see the mouse cursor? Yes, you can. Okay, so I can actually point at stuff and so on. That might be good for the video. Let's continue. And now what we can do is pick our mutations. So we have Physical mutations, mental mutations, physical defects, and mental defects. We have, as you can see down here, we have 12 points that we can basically distribute amongst our mutations. And each mutation has a cost associated with it. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick a few mutations that will be as basically as um, yeah, that basically will be beneficial for the character type I want to play. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get multiple arms. So we have an extra set of arms and we have an 8% of each extra arm to deliver an additional melee attack whenever you make a melee attack. So what we want to do is we want to ba basically be able to just attack with a flurry of little devious melee attacks. So we are not going to be the big lumbering type, we're going to be fast and quick. So multiple arms is going to be awesome for that. So let's get that. Um, since we have very little strength and toughness, the beginning will be kind of dangerous for us because we are so frail. And um, since in the beginning our damage output will be determined by our strength, we, won't, we will be having a really tough time. And also because we are just melee. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get Flaming Hands, which is a... Um, yeah, you emit jets of flame from your hands. So that's an attack that does 1d6 damage in the beginning, we, and we cannot wear gloves, but um, we can set enemies on fire, and that is going to be really useful for us. I think we will re probably, this will in the beginning be our main damage output, and this is a really good skill to have in the very beginning of the game, because that means you can basically stay away from your enemies and uh, just not get them to or like prevent them from coming near you because like in the beginning our dodge value won't be as high as it should be and um, yeah our melee damage output will be almost nothing so we have to be careful about that and it has a cooldown of 10 rounds which um, is like not to be neglected but it's okay so um, it's not so much that we you can actually use Flaming Hands as your primary damage dealing in combat, at least in the beginning. So we, we are going to get that, and those are basically the important things, and we're just going to get a little extra stuff. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pick a Morpho, a morpho type, which is kind of interesting. Um, there's Chimera and Esper, which means you can only manifest physical mutations or you can only manifest mental mutations. So we can't pick Esper because we already have physical mutations. Um, this is interesting because you can actually get more mutations by spending mutation points that you get by leveling up. And we don't want mental mutations to come from that. So we're going to pick Chimera, that we only manifest physical mutations. I don't know, like at some point we are probably going to try for new mutations. I don't know what this is going to be, but uh, yeah. And um, so we have still two points left. What I'm now also going to get is night vision. That means we see in the dark and we don't need to worry about stuff like uh, stuff like um, carrying torches around and so on, which is good in the beginning. Later on, you mostly find some good stuff, like you get stuff like floating glow spears that just float nearby and you have light and it is no problem. So. Um, that is why night vision is only really useful in the beginning of the game, but it is really useful in the beginning of the game. And um, we have also four arms, so it wouldn't actually be all that bad to carry around a torch in one of them. But uh, now we're going to be able to have weapons in all four in all four hands, and that's going to be good. So night vision, and we have one more. You can do slime glands. You can produ you produce a viscous slime that you can spit at things. Not gonna pick that. I'm just going to pick thick fur, which means we are covered in a thick coat of fur, which protects us from the elements. We have plus four heat resistance, plus four cold resistance, which can be kind of nice. And we have plus 100 reputation with apes. So um, if you run across apes that could be hostile to us, um, maybe they're actually not going to be hostile to us because we have, yeah, we are furry. We kind of look like an ape ourselves. So, um, yeah, they will be maybe kind of friendly. We're not going to go with any defects now. Like the defects, obviously, they work in the way that you can actually get that and then you have two more points or something. So for some character builds, it can actually be necessary to also have defects and you always have to kind of um, look what uh, you always kind of have to... Oh God, I am totally blank on words right now, but... Uh, yeah, you always have to kind of 
manage manage that stuff. There are some defects in here that are really, really, really defective for your character build. So you know, have to kind of measure that, I guess. But for now, let's pick this character. We are done with the character creation. Already 15 minutes, so uh, this is probably going to be a little longer. And um, as I said, I'm going to... This is going to be sort of in the beginning i'm talking a lot um we're going to i'm going to make this process a lot um yeah a lot quicker in subsequent runs okay character creation select calling this is sort of a class and it determines the starting skills that you have so we're going to pick an agility based calling there's this Arconaut, and there is Gunslinger, which is also plus two agility. Those are the two mutated human callings that have agility bonuses. So we're going to pick one of those. Gunslinger is basically, we get the skills that we get is Steady Hands and Weak Spotter, which are for ranged attacks. We're not going to do with that, uh, or we're not going to... That sentence did not make any sense. We're not going to pick that one because, uh, yeah, we want to be melee. So we're going to pick Archon Arconaut. And with that, we get Gadget Inspector and Scavenger, which is something that we don't need, really, I guess. This is for tinkering and crafting and so on. And we're probably not going to put much into that. I think I'm going to leave that by the wayside, even though that means that we have a few superfluous skills right now, but um, that's okay. But what we get is spry, dodge, and short blade expertise. And that is good, because short blade is going to be the melee skill tree that we're going to pick. And spry and dodge is what we want, because we want to have as high as a dodge value as possible. We're going to take a look at what these exactly do um, once we are in the game. So let's pick the Arconaut. We get plus two to agility, which makes this even higher, and uh, that is good. And now we are done. That was a process, but this is how the character creation works in Case of Code. And the game gives you like a myriad of options. You can do all kinds of stuff, and you can do ridiculous and great stuff and this is one of the main draws of the game so and i really love that so yeah let's begin the game i'm not going to yeah we you can press enter to have a name chosen for us and how about we just do that i don't feel like thinking up a name right now so this is where the game starts the game always starts in the oasis hamlet of joppa always in the same town and the sun the town will always look the same with the same people in it and um, yeah, it's a little, just a little tiny town of farmers and they are growing water vine and yeah, all right. On the horizon cuts jungles, strangle chrome steeples and rusted archways to the earth. Further and beyond the fabled spindle rises above the fray and pierces the cloud ribboned sky. Okay, so what we are basically is we are someone who wants to make their fortune by treasure hunting and exploring the lands. Problem is, the lands are really extremely hostile, so we have to be really careful here. So here we are. We are this guy down here, this little person. And um, there are always, like the beginning of Cable Cut is always the same steps. What you do is you get your first two quests, like one quest you get by from this guy, and another you get from a guy that lives over there. These are basically determined like the first steps you take in the game. What you also do is you rob all the houses. There are three houses, houses here that you can rob without being detected. So we're going to do that to just get a bit of stuff in the beginning. What you get is always randomly determined. So sometimes you get really awesome stuff. Sometimes you get just junk, but that's just how it goes. And we're going to get some food because this game, of course, has a food and water system. And then we're going to yeah, go on our way, explore the areas a little, and just start doing the first quest. All right, so first thing, let's talk to this guy. Live and drink, friend. May you find shade in Joppa. So this is the conversation system, simple multiple choice system. And uh, we can ask him, what can you tell me about Joppa? He can't tell us much, but he refers us to Elder Irudad, and we can get a bunch of lore and a bunch of stuff. But um, maybe I'm not going to worry about that just now. I'm in search of work. So he will give us a quest. Some critters are eating our water vine. So they have a bunch of problems with, uh, with like critters, with weird animal 
things that are disrupting their harvest, I guess. And he noticed a bit of red dirt in the water vine pool, the same that they find in the soil at a nearby cave to the north we call Red Rock. Travel to Red Rock and kill these things and bring a corpse back. So, nothing easier than that. Um, so this is going to be basically the first thing that we're going to do in the game. Like the first thing we're going to do outside. We're going to wander around a little just to mainly gain a few levels and just um, get ourselves started and then we're going to go down down the cave of Red Rock. Um, let me just open the map right now. This is the map. We are down here, this is Joppa, and this is Red Rock. So um, like each of these tiles is just a bunch of different uh, different screens in the game. So it's not like one tile is one screen, but uh, yeah. So this is going to be like five or six or seven, I don't know, screens up from Joppa. Uh, we have to find the we have to find the cave, but it is mostly easy to find because it's always in a straight line up from Joppa. Okay, so so far so good. Let's talk to this guy again. What we're going to do is we're going to trade with him, and he has vine wafers. Vine wafers are cheap food that we're going to get. The good thing about vine wafers is that they don't weigh anything, and uh, yeah, as you can see here, we have. A carry capacity of 189 pounds, so we always have to be careful about not carrying too much. And since they don't weigh anything, they are pretty good. And, um, yeah. So, we're going to buy 281 vine wafers. Not all of them, for the simple reason that, uh, yeah, let's give him our water. The currency in this game is water, which is also kind of interesting. So... All right, here's one more vine wafer. Um, the reason why I did that was, okay, they apparently changed some stuff. Okay, normally when you get all the vine wafers and he doesn't have anything anymore, you can't trade with him anymore. But now that has actually kind of changed because now he, he doesn't have all that water that we gave him. So it doesn't matter. So we can just buy that as well and uh, be done with it. Offer, yes. Nothing to trade. So this game has kind of a um, bartering econo economic system, so to say. You barter with the people for stuff. And uh, the thing most resembling a currency in this game is water. But you also need water to survive, so that creates an interesting dynamic. Alright, so let's start robbing the houses. This is always a house that you can rob. You always have to close the door so nobody sees you robbing that chest. So let's do that. What do we have? So we have an iron battle axe, a bronze dagger, which is something that we can use. A um, bunch of torches that we don't need because we have night vision. We have leather moccasins. Let's take a look at those. Um, for every piece of armor that you find, this is the armor value and this is the dodge value. We want to get stuff that has dodge value. So this is not really anything here. Um, yeah, we're not going to look for this, we're going to look for this. If you play like a tanky character, you want armor value and so on. It's actually pretty easy. This is a, an artifact, a small turquoise tube. Artifact means we don't know what that is. What we can do is we're going to try and examine that. Since we have pretty high intelligence, we should probably be good at doing that. And we make some progress understanding the self-injector. Self-injector is awesome because that's a healing thing. So um, we're going to hold on to that. We also have a skulk injector. Let's look at that. What's that? Those are basically like potions in other games. Plus three. Plus three agility at night and underground, minus three agility in the daylight. So that could actually be kind of cool once we are spelunking in caves, uh, but we have only one of those. This is our inventory. This is basically ca categorized by categories. We have a basic toolkit. What does that do? Increase the likelihood of recovering additional bits when you disassemble an artifact. So we're not going to do much with that. Um, this is scrap, that's basically the stuff that you use to craft. These are weapons, this is torches, we're going to sell those, I guess. This is food, very important, we start with mystery meat. Um, and those vine wafers we just bought. 
We have a bunch of grenades and we have those leather moccasins. So ex let's e just equip those because we don't have anything on our feet. Let's take a look at our equipment just now. So this is all our, of our equipment here. Like the stuff can be kind of daunting at the beginning, but once you get into it, it's really easy to navigate and uh, really easy to wrap your head around. So these are basically all of our equipment slots. So we have body, head, face, one on back, like all that kind of stuff. So we have a Vinewood sap mask on our face right now, and we are wearing a pocketed west vest, uh, which, yeah, increases our carry capacity by a little. It also has plus one to dodge value, so that's kind of good. Once we get better stuff that increases our dodge value further, we're going to exchange that. Um, in our left hand, we're carrying a lit torch right now. Let's extinguish that because we don't need it and remove it. Um, we have a short bow that we're not going to use, so let's unload that short bow and remove it. We have a burnt capacitor in our left hand. We're going to remove that because we don't need to carry around scrap in our left hand. Uh, there's a wooden arrow in our right hand, which we don't need. Um, we can't put anything on our hands, like on one of our one set of our hands, because um, yeah, there are ghostly flames because we have the flaming hands mutation. So we can't wear any gloves on that. But we have another set of hands, and we can wear gloves on that. So that's good. There are gloves that increase, or like, if we find gloves that increase dodge value, we can still wear them, because we have another set of hands, so that's good. And uh, let's remove the grenade for now, because um, we're mostly going to use our flaming hands for that stuff. And floating nearby, we don't have anything to use in that slot right now. We found another dagger, so uh, let's put this dagger here, and we also have one, even one more dagger. So let's put that in our other right hand. And basically what we're going to do is we're going to wear daggers or short swords in all of these, in all four of our hands, so that we can just kill everything with those. So the next house we can rob is this one. What do we have here? We have some bandages, which could be kind of good. We have a bronze short sword, that's good. That's also a short blade. We have copper nuggets, which are trade goods. They are good. Because they weigh less than uh, they weigh less than than the water that we would have to carry around. So um, we can't drink it, of course. So um, yeah, this is basically going to be also kind of currency for us. All right, I'm talking a lot. I was kind of straining for the voice, but uh, that's okay. Are you sure you want to open it? Yes, I do. And we found a white-brimmed hat. And that is good, because for some reason, a white-brimmed hat increases our dodge value. We definitely want that. Another grenade and a cracked lens. So let's wear the white-brimmed hat on our head, which now means we have a dodge value of 15, um, which is good for the beginning, but uh, of course we want to get that much higher. All right. So far, so good. Now, a little more stuff that we can do is we can talk to this guy, and this is the trader of the town. He's a dromad merchant, and we can trade with him. Again, we have this bartering thing. He, he has, like, <coughs> terrible prices. Probably not being going to be able to afford anything. But for the time being, he's just going to be the guy on whom we are going to dump all the junk that we find. For example, all those torches. And we're going to get a bunch of um, water for that. So that's good. A bunch of stuff. So we're going to barter with him and going to, yeah, dump off our stuff that we find that we don't need. Since I'm not going to do any tinkering, I guess, with this one, I don't know if that's actually a good idea or not, but um, I'm just going to sell off all that stuff. Um, Copper nugget, no. As you can see, one copper nugget is worth 10 drams of water, so that's kind of good for now. Let's see what you have. You have a silver nugget, actually, which is worth 50. That's nice. Um, another self injector, those are worth a lot, at least if you're buying them. The good thing about um, copper nuggets is also, uh, like about those trade goods, is that they are not worth more buying like 
Buying a self-injector costs 190, selling one you get 8.40 for them. And that is like a gigantic difference. With those trade nuggets, there isn't any of that. I mean, we could, we were, would be able to haggle down the price a bunch more if we had more, um, yeah, more bartering abilities. Higher ego stat, I guess. So, this is the stuff that he has. Nothing really interesting. Bronze dagger, carbide. So these are basically the different tiers of um, weapons. So we're going to, like the next tier after bronze is iron, then you have steel, and after steel you have carbide, and it basically goes on. Um, we just want to get short blades in the best tier that we can get. So uh, we want to get iron short blades over bronze short blades, and we want to get carbide or steel over iron and carbide over, over steel, and so on and so forth. So let's get rid of all of our nonsense that we have, that we don't need. So let's make an offer. We don't need those wooden arrows, but they don't weigh anything. So whatever, but I'm going to sell them anyways. So let's offer, and he will give us 18 drams of fresh water. He has 195, so that's okay. Let's offer it to him, and the trade is complete. So what you don't want to do, you want to have a healthy amount of water with you, but you don't want too much water. You don't want to lug around too much water, basically. So f and this is the point where all those trade goods come in and become interesting. So if you can have like a silver nugget, which is worth 50, instead of carrying lugging around like 50 drams of water, that is pretty awesome. That's pretty good. So um, let's talk to this guy. This is the last thing we're going to do here in Joppa. And he's just like a weird inventor kind of person, Argive. And uh, he gives us a few quests. He says he wants a knick-knack from one of the caves. And uh, let's accept that quest. And we have already finished the quest. The thing is, the knick-knacks that he wants are things that count as artifacts. What count as artifacts are those grenades and are those injectors. Uh, since we don't really need the grenades, we're just going to give him a few grenades there. So, um... We have three high explosive grenades. Maybe let's just hold on to the high explosive one and give him the stun gas grenade. We get some experience for that. Let's accept the next quest, which is fetch him another knickknack. Give that to him. And we're just going to give him the thermal grenade because we can already like light stuff on fire, no problem. 150 XP and you are on level two. So this is always a way if you start with a character that starts out with a bunch of um, artifacts already, like the Arconaut that we are. Um, yeah, you can basically just give him the stuff in the very beginning and uh, you don't need to hunt for that. And you basically get your first level up for free. And now we can get the next quest and he needs some copper wire um, for, a, for a thingamabob he's putting together. And the copper wire, let's open up the quest log, is in the rust wells east of Joppa. So the rust wells on the map are these things here, right? And we will find copper wire around there. Um, but this is basically the second thing that we're going to do after we have finished this first quest here. And this is basically how the game always starts out. So in subsequent runs, we are just going to quickly do all of that without just... Yeah, without just dwelling on that as much as we did just now. These rooms are always empty, so that doesn't matter. Let's continue. Let's get on our way here. One more thing that we have to do. We have to, like, assign hotkeys to our ability, Flaming Hands. So we're going to put this on one. And now we can use this to shoot stuff. As you can see, we have this little reticle here and can just use that to attack things. Hmm, there's a little graveyard here, which I don't remember actually. Can you actually inspect that? No, look. Yeah, here lies drowned in a lake by a pygmy stalker. I think they are probably also procedurally generated. Fell asleep on a luminous moat. Hmm, that's cool. All right, okay, so. Also another thing, we leveled up already, so let's go in here. You have already seen this. Um, this is our attributes. And as you can see, we got a bunch of skill points for leveling up. 
and we got a mutation point and we can put a mutation point a mutation point into one of our mutations the only two that we can actually increase are flaming hands which um increasing flaming hands is pretty good because this is a 1d6 damage and this basically each increase here increases this by one like the amount of dice by one so this is a one six sided dice so we do one to six damage and this now means we do two to twelve damage and um, that like if you get flaming hands to a decent um like to a decent number you do just bollocks loads of damage with that there's also multiple arms and that increases the chance for each extra arm to deliver an additional melee attack so um that is also good to increase the thing is you can only increase each mutation every two levels the good thing is we have only two mut mutations that we can increase so what we're going to do is we're going to basically just alternate between the two in increasing them also this is the skill tree which also looks pretty in intimidating but it's actually kind of easy so this is also like the game also works um like everything else everything is put into categories and you have to basically unlock the category with skill points to put points into the various skills what we have is acrobatics short blades and tinkering we're not going to worry with, with tinkering but um yeah this is basically going to be our primary skill point sync what we're going to get is the first thing that we're going to get is this skill, Shank. What Shank does means is that whenever you make an attack with a short blade, your attack is modified by your agility rather than your strength. So this is what we're going to get. See what I meant with, um, yeah. So um, our low strength won't actually hinder us anymore. So what we're going to this is going to be the first skill that I'm going to get because it's essential for us to be able to do just any damage. And since we got 98 skill points per level up, we're going to have to be on level three to actually get Shank. Going to take a bit, but uh, yeah, that's okay. And, and then we're going, basically just going to get the rest. Another one that is really important is Rejoinder. We're going to talk about that later some more. And what we want to get is dual wielding. So that increases the chance to attack with an offhand weapon. And since we have four hands with which we want to attack, yeah, dual wielding is really important for us. And that is also a huge skill point sink. So you actually, to max out that tree, you, net, you need 900 skill points, which is a lot. Yeah, so um, that's what we're going to do. That's the plan. Now, 37 minutes and we haven't started the game yet. We're going to do that in the next episode. So this is going to be, now we have all the preliminaries out of the way. In the next episode, we're going to start exploring the world, try not to get killed. And um, basically what we're going to do is we're going to try to get our first few levels to just get a bearing of our surroundings and see what is where and so on. And um, yeah, try to get some decent equipment and, um, to basically ready ourselves for what this game has in store for us. Thank you for watching me ramble through all this stuff. And uh, it's going to, the pace is going to pick up, I promise. Bye.